We started a little study in prayer meeting uh, some uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, I promised to finish at that time, but uh, I believe since I'm going to be here for a couple of Sundays, we uh, will back up and uh, uh, do it for our Sunday school class this Sunday and next Sunday, Lord willing. And I'd like for you to note, by way of uh, an introduction, uh, verses 24 down through the entire 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And uh, watch very carefully as we read particularly the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews because there are three phrases that occur over and over again. And uh, we want you to uh, look at this because we would like to spend our time together uh, for our Sunday school, even though we dealt with a part of it for our prayer meeting hour some time ago. Verse 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that sprinkleth better things, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation or conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conduct. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. <coughs> Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well-pleasing. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy. <coughs> with joy and not with grief, for this is unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, 
through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Salute them that have the rule over you, and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Now, as we have read this portion of the word in your presence, you have observed that in uh, the 13th chapter, <clears throat> we have three verses which uh, begin with a clause that is very similar. The only thing that has changed <clears throat> in these three verses happens to be the first word of the sentence. For instance, verse 7, Remember them which have the rule over you. Verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you. Verse 24, Salute all them that have the rule over you. Now, we have these three phrases or these three clauses. And yet those three clauses must be taken within the framework of the verse itself and also within the framework of the context. If we're going to understand with uh, blessing that which is before us, we can often take passages like this take them out of context and do a great deal of injustice, not only to the biblical revelation, but also to the practical aspect of teaching. I personally like to take from verse 25. I missed, I went back to verse 24. I should have started verse 25. And I like to consider verses 25 down through verse 29, an introduction, an introduction to this 13th chapter. And I believe it's a fitting introduction for us because we read of one major wonderful emphasis of truth. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. And as we journey down through these few verses, we discover that there's emphasis upon emphasis concerning that which is spoken. And one of the things we observe is the tremendous power of the revelation that is given because he speaks about the matter of shaking the earth by virtue of his word. Then secondly, he speaks not only about shaking the earth, but shaking both earth and heaven. Isn't that right? Now then, when you have a person that is able to do that by virtue of his word, it in, uh, it's incumbent upon us that we give heed. Isn't that right? Um, I, I haven't been around too many places where when someone spoke, why uh, the uh, place just uh, shuddered. <laughs> now, I've uh, been in places where you would like to have some earplugs uh, and all of that with a bunch of racket, but that's because of a great crowd that uh, may break forth in exuberance over some particular incident. But here, I'm brought face to face with a person. See that you don't refuse him. And the emphasis, don't refuse him with reference to what he has to say. And then there is the uh, appeal for godly conduct in light of this person, in light of his revelation. And why? Because that person who is so powerful, who, is, who did when he spoke, shook the earth many years ago, and who will, with a word, not only destroy the present heavens and the present earth, but who will, with that same word, I'm told, he is a consuming fire. Consuming fire. Now, I've often asked myself the question, how much of this sinks into our heart? How much of it does? Um... Do we just come to it in light of the fact, well, 
this is just another reading of the Bible. This is just another presentation of the book. Do we believe what we read? Do we believe what is here? If we do, it's going to have an effect. It really is. Now then, having said that by way of introduction, that person who speaks with such power and with such instruction for us and who is to be terribly feared if one is not in right relationship with him because he is a terrific judge, he's the consuming fire, he gives us now his revelation in chapter 13. And I believe in this 13th chapter it can be divided very, very nicely into three parts. In verses 1 through 7, you have the emphasis of conduct, conduct. Then in verses 8 through 17, you have the emphasis of service, service. And then in verses 18 to the end of the chapter, you have the emphasis by virtue of a salutation or that which is simply the concluding remarks of this chapter and an appeal for prayer and so forth. So if you would look at it in light of that threefold division, I believe we'll have something that makes terrific sense by way of these three particular verses that we have pointed out. Now again, the introduction. A person of power, who has spoken, who will speak, and the only thing that will remain after he destroys the present heavens and the present earth are only those things which are eternal. That's all that will remain. Nothing from a temporal point of view will remain here in this whole creation. Therefore, let us give heed to the first division which speaks and emphasizes conduct, conduct. And I believe this to be the area of importance in verses 1 through 7. I'm going to read it again, and then we'll just point out a few things and zero in on this verse, which I believe is so grossly misunderstood. Let brotherly love continue. That's talking about conduct, isn't it? And it happens to be conduct in a relationship with other people. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Now marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conduct. Now, as he starts into this section, he's talking about a relationship, one with another. Isn't that right? And he's talking about how our hearts and our fellowship should be that which is right before him, and even those that we do not know. Now, some have had some, uh, uh, some tremendous experiences this way. Uh, I recall a number of years ago that there was a rap at, at our door, and I went, to that, uh, uh, I went to the door and answered, and there stood a man, and um, he um, uh, requested that uh, he might be able to come in and have a meal with us. And uh, 
I turned him down. Now, that was the first time I had ever turned anyone down like that. And uh, the background for my turning him down was this, that we had just previously, within the last uh, uh, two months at that time, as I recall, we'd had a very, very sad experience. We had had another gentleman that uh, came to us and um, had uh, conned us in uh, quite a good way. And um, uh, he befriended us, and uh, we took him to the ministry, like we always did do, and anyone that we could uh, entertain. And um, uh, lo and behold, he did a good job there, too. Um, he uh, got next to our treasure. And uh, before long, <laughs> he made it stick. Uh, our treasurer wound up giving him some money and took a bogus check. And so <clears throat> I thought to myself, now, you just better quit being so gullible. And when I got this rap at the door, uh, immediately on the background of uh, this, this problem, I turned him down. But just as soon as I closed that door, I felt awful. I just felt terrible. And then to make things worse, Lila said, you know, Al, we could have fed him. Well, that's all it took. I grabbed my coat and my hat, and I jumped, and he'd just been gone. I said, well, I'll catch him. And so I backed out of the driveway, and I didn't know which way he'd go. But um, I ventured to guess, and I started up the street. And you know, I went up every single street in our locality there in that city. And I know, I just know he couldn't have gotten very far away. I just know he couldn't have. That I couldn't find him for love or money. I couldn't find him anyway. And I spent, oh, a good hour just hunting for that fellow because going to get him, bring him home, feed him. But I've never forgotten that. Never have forgotten that. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat uh, convinced that uh, uh, we can do these things. It says, uh, uh, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And then... He said, look, care for those that are in bonds. Again, conduct. Then conduct with reference to marriage and the warning with reference to that which is illicit. And then our conduct with reference to possessions. And then our conduct in confidence with the Lord. But then in verse 7, another verse dealing with conduct. Dealing with conduct. Verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conduct. Now I believe this has been grossly misunderstood. And I believe it's been grossly applied in many cases. So remember them which have the rule over you. That is this, exactly the same wording in verse 7, 17, and 24. And you will observe them which have the rule over you, them which have the rule over you, and etc. Now, when you look up these particular words in your Greek lexicon, you are going to discover <coughs> that uh, uh, the words are quite accurate. However, the concept many times is misunderstood. And uh, the word rule, the word rule has been so terribly misused. Some months ago, I read an article in Interest magazine uh, with reference to an assembly that had to close down in a particular area. And uh, <clears throat> the note was this, that um, 
uh, we have had to uh, close our assembly because we had elders that ruled. Did you get that? We had elders that ruled. Now, is that what an elder is to do? Yes and no. The word rule here means to guide. Guide in the sense of being a leader. Consequently, what we have here in the first part of verse 7 is something wonderful. I said, remember them which have the rule, leading, guiding you, over you. Now, do you see something? You have two things involved. You have the instruction for the lead. You have the instruction for the leader, right? In that particular clause. Incidentally, that word remember happens to be an imperative. It is a command. And it's a command that is um, one to uh, be in the present tense, I believe. Let me just check that to make sure. In uh, uh, verse, uh, better get the right chapter. Yes, present tense. And the word remember by virtue of definition is to give due consideration. Give due consideration, remember, in light of giving particular consideration to those who rule or to those who lead or guide you. There you have responsibility of both, isn't it right? Absolutely so. Responsibility on the one hand, responsibility on the other hand. One is to give due consideration, and the other is to give due consideration with reference to function. Isn't that right? Make sure the leading, make sure the guiding is proper. Now, consider this. Why? Do gi give due consideration because of what follows. Who have spoken unto you what? the Word of God. Now then, how is this guiding? What is to characterize the guiding with reference to conduct? What is it? It is the Word of the Lord, isn't that right? Absolutely so. It is the book. It's the revelation. And why? Haven't we just read in verses 25 through 29 the importance of the revelation of the Word of God. And we said, see that we do not refuse or decline the one that speaketh, whose word is so powerful that he can not only shake the earth, but he shakes the heavens. What is the responsibility of leadership responsibility of leadership in light of guidance is to make sure that that which is central with reference to function is that book, that book, the word of the Lord. And oh, it, it, it's, it's absolutely horrible, just horrible when we uh, look at some things which are taking place, and I'm not here just to criticize this morning at all, because I want to show you something that follows it. But my, uh, what is going on? Uh, it, it's, it's dire, dire responsibility of leadership to make sure that the ministry is the word of the Lord. The responsibility of those within then the ministry 
is to give due consideration and proper consideration with reference to the leadership who are ministering the word of the Lord. Now then, notice what it does. It takes it from the word to what? Whose faith follow? Now, there's just a little bit of difficulty um, concerning this particular translation. But if I could uh, uh, possibly help you on it, is it beholding the issue of conduct? All right. Is it in ministry just leadership of speaking of the word of the Lord? Is that what it is? No. It is that which issues forth from conduct. From life. It is message, but also life. You see the conduct? This is the re you see the context? We've just dealt with verses 1 through 7 that relate to conduct. And so he closes that section by virtue of leadership and the lead in relationship to conduct. Now then, what is the product? What is the product? That would use issues forth. What's the product of leadership? What's going to be the end of that product? What is the standard? What is the fruit, in other words, of that life? Let me give you an illustration which is totally removed in every way, shape, or form from local influence. I was in a ministry, <clears throat> in a conference ministry, down in the southern part of the province. There was a youth ministry that uh, it, was, it was sort of a conference for the youth. And uh, there were a number of the young people from the various ministries in that particular area that had gotten together uh, for their uh, youth retreat and youth conference and so forth. And there was a leader that was responsible for <coughs> the, the conference, you know. And um, uh, the young people <coughs> were billeted in the various homes. And um, uh, w this particular night... Uh, the leader received a phone call from the host of one of the homes and said, uh, the young people that you billeted here came in at a decent hour and we thought they went to their room. They did go to the room, but they opened the window and went out the window. And uh, we don't know where they are, and we feel bad because uh, we are hosts. And so the leader said, oh, well, I'll see what I can do. And do you know what he found? He found this gang of kids out of the motel just hooping it up. He went to the phone and just a few miles away was the leading elder of some of these young people. In fact, he was the father of a couple of them. And so this leader called him and said, um, I think I'm going to have to have some help from you. And he told him what was taking place. 
Now get the reply of the elder. That's your problem, not mine. That's the leading elder in that particular ministry, and it's a well-known ministry, and a father, and a father. What is the conduct? What's the fruit of conduct? Consider it well. What is the fruit? What's the conduct? Don't you see the reason for the importance of the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1 with reference to families? With reference to their relationship to materialism? with reference to their relationship to the 15 things that are mentioned there in 1 Timothy. This is exceedingly important today because in the closing chapter, closing chapter of Hebrews, you have the two in such wonderful balance and harmony. Give the proper consideration, responsibility of those who are led, to the responsibility of those who give guidance to you by speaking what, by ministering what, by having what kind of a ministry? The ministry of the word of the Lord. Why? Because the ministry of the word of the Lord is to produce a conduct. A conduct. That is to be given due consideration of that conduct not only from the those that do the leading but those that are led. Again, Perfect harmony and balance with reference to the assembly. Now then, it says to do something. In the last part of that verse, actually this is the Greek word. Mimic. Mimic. The what? Faith. Now here, don't you see what the faith is? Faith is is twofold by virtue of the emphasis of this verse. Faith is the faith that's the body of truth. And faith is the faith that's the shoe leather of that body of truth. Remember Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteous righteousness of God revealed what from faith unto faith all right now justify for me if you will my experience of coming home from Toronto talking to this young man unsaved, trying to identify for him what kind of a ministry you had, and bringing to his attention an individual who was an elder of a like ministry. And that boy said this, Oh, I didn't know he was a Christian. But listen to what he said. He sure got a good job. What's the emphasis of that elder's life? You be the judge. 
I can only say this for my life. If a person works around me for a year and doesn't know that I'm a believer, but I have a good job, one that's paying good money, and one whereby I have a position of prestige, and that man doesn't know that I belong to Jesus Christ, then what's my conduct? What is my conduct? You be the judge. Now, I'm fully aware of the fact that both leadership and those that are led fall within the category of 1 John. We've all got a sin nature, right? Absolutely so. If you're hunting for a perfect leader and if you're hunting for a perfect assembly, you know something? You better die so you can go home and find it. But Hebrews chapter 13 ends. This section, conduct, both for people who are in the assembly and for those that are to be leaders of the assembly. Now, for next Lord's Day, let me give you an assignment. Would you please take verses 8 through 17? Notice here in this section, it changes by virtue of emphasis just a little, but it changes to the emphasis of service. Service. From conduct to service, then a salutation of your clothes. And I think it will thrill your heart to see again the perfect balance and the proper relationship from a biblical and spiritual point of view. But please don't forget, you're dealing with the Word of God. You are dealing with one whose Word will shake and destroy the heavens and the earth and the only thing that will remain is that which is eternal and that which is temporal oh our God is a consuming fire doesn't it behoove us to give heed to thus saith the Lord our Father <clears throat> we thank you for your graciousness in your love upon our hearts and our lives that we might know whereof you speak and our dear father when you do speak we just trust our, that you will work upon our hearts and upon our wills that we might be receptive and responsive we're grateful for the privilege of having time together and now as we wait before you for continued uh, instruction from the word of the Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God will take the things of your own dear heart and make them very precious.